Hello, I'm Ileana Pena. I'm from Central Michigan University in Michigan uh, and an adjunct professor of epidemiology and biostats at Case Western. And this is my blog. This is our third conversation this year at the ESC, which is being held in Amsterdam. This is a terrific meeting that many of us have attended in the past because we start to see the new stuff coming out. The, the late breaking trials are always exciting. They usually get published at the same time. But this year we have maybe a richness of heart failure stuff. Um, and we're gonna have to decide how we're going to apply all this to that patient that's sitting in front of us in clinic. And with me today is a very dear friend, Dr. Carolyn Lam from Singapore. Uh, Carolyn is a professor at the Duke University, Singapore, and a consultant for the National Institutes. Plus, she spent time in Framingham, and she's been a spokesperson for Framingham. And I've heard her deliver some beautiful lectures on things like pulmonary hypertension, an area that's Ileana, really you found. forgot my most important um, uh, title. Oh, I'm I'm the chairperson of the Ileana Pena fan club. <laughs> I did not pay you to say that, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and a wonderful mom of a beautiful baby. <laughs> so um, Carolyn and I are going to have a chat because what I've asked Carolyn about is we've got, you know, Verisiguat in the United States now approved. I'm Captain McCarvel in, in the works, I think, of being approved. We are all in love with the SGLT2 inhibitors, regardless of which one, because they all have very similar findings. But we can't forget our good old RAS inhibition, our MRAs, and we certainly can't forget our beta blockers. And the beta blockers do take up titration time. The SGLT2s, they don't need to be up titrated. So that makes it a little bit easier. But even Verisigual, you start at a low dose and you go to a higher dose. Mm -hmm. uh, even Secubitril Valsartan, you start at the low dose, you go at the high dose. How are we going to do this, Carolyn? How are we going to put it all together? And, and what kind of conversations do we need to have with our patients? Where is precision medicine in all this? Mm, wow. Okay, that's a lot. I would say the short answer is by simplifying and by keeping the aim very, very clearly in our minds when we see a patient with HEFREF. So first, let's talk about seeing a patient in an outpatient setting that's not acutely unstable, cardiogenic shock, or, de or congested. So in that situation, it's really very clear for me. I know that they're the foundational four, if you, if you, you know, the ARNI beta blocker MRA SGLT2 inhibitors. And honestly, just keep it simple. Try to get them on all of these as quickly as possible. And I would say, don't leave a gap in the mechanisms at the expense of up titrating. So that's my principle. I don't, um, you know, because I run out of blood pressure space from trying to get the RNAs to the very highest doses really, really quickly. And therefore I can't even give a little bit of beta blocker. I don't do that. You know, I, I really, really think it's important that a patient has at least some beta blockade if they're in a decongested stable state, they, they need to, because I really believe that they, they're very effective in the sudden cardiac death prevention and you- And you in know, reverse really remodeling. That, that. And they are exactly, the master of reverse course. Yes. Yeah. Of course, yeah. And so that that's kind of how I try to simplify it in my mind. I, I know that there've been all kinds of different permutations of it, uh, uh, of, of the strategy of how to sequence and so on. Honestly, isn't it just common sense and really um, judging by the patient and, and the things that we look at in the patient are their blood pressure, the heart rate, whether or not their atrial fibrillation or sinus rhythm, um, and then uh, their potassium, their creatinine. And from that, really, really just try to get them to target. Yeah, one of my um, uh, approaches to patients is depending upon how symptomatic they are, as you're saying, is that when I give them the RAS block or whatever it is, ACE, ARB, or ARNI, I tell them that they're going to feel better because they will. And they'll feel better within a week. When I give them the beta blocker, I don't no. say that. Yeah. I don't no. say yeah. that. But I tell them you may feel a little bit more tired, but it's going to go away. Just stick with me. So I've always done the RAS thing first. And like you say, maybe give them little bit of beta blocker just to get them started. Because as you 
I am scared of sudden death because yeah. that's the one thing that's our first defense against sudden death is the exactly. beta blocker. Um, but then now with the SGLT2s, and we started using these when I was still in New York, even before we knew that they worked in the non-diabetics and what I thought of, well, I'm going to send them back to their primary care to get their SGLT2s because this is part of their diabetes work. Uh, the patients were coming back without the SGLT2s. Mm. So they weren't being started. And I think Dr. Braunwald has been telling us that we need to become diabetologists in a way too. And so we started just giving it ourselves, uh, you know, and managing it ourselves. But oh. these patients are on so many other drugs that are very complicated. Uh, you know, we, we counted when they leave the hospital, they're on 13 drugs. How can you take 13 drugs in a day? It's true. And Eliana, I'm sure you do as I do, which is, you know, I, I tell all my patients, bring it all yep. and really cut the crap. I'm sorry, but you know, you've got a heparin patient who's struggling with blood pressure space. Why are they on a lot of pin? That's exactly right. right. Why, why, why on, on things like that? So I, I do that. I, I take that out. And then of course there are choices that we make with medications, beta blockers, for example, they're the twice a day you could do the short acting and give it like three times a day, but you know, there are also the long acting ones. And so we choose the long acting ones if they're tolerating it and so on. So there are ways that we can help the patient there. I'd like to also though emphasize that even as I've said to simplify it into those four, it is very important to remember the backups. And I, I, I have these backup lists of five and that is Ivabradine, you know, if, if I've maxed out on beta blockers and the heart rate's still not, not there, I, I do believe. Which is I've not ever, usual, which is not usual. Yeah, but I, I have that in my back pocket. Yeah. I do remember to look at the iron. Oh, a very important. I've, I've, see, I've, I've witnessed my patients. Very important. So thank hard. me after we give them intravenous iron and yes, those that yes. are very they iron They feel deficient. so much like, better. They feel exactly. so much better particularly the older women who have been dealing with iron deficiency exactly. for years and nobody's done anything. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I also, you know, truly believe the data that we see with Verisigwat. It got a class two recommendation in the new ESC guidelines, but, you know, Verisigwat, remember, was a large positive study in a, in a, in a population with a really unmet need. And very high yeah. event rate, very exactly. high event rate. And this is despite being on the standard medications. Right, right. And so, you know, and for, so that's my, if they keep worsening, you really got to pull out the very cigarette card. Yep, yep, yep. I, I agree right. with you. And you and I are going to be looking at the women and the older patients in that trial. So hopefully. Absolutely. Do you, do you think about sleep apnea as another option here? <clears throat> Another I do. Potential. I have to say that when I was practicing in Rochester at Olmsted County and in, in, in Mayo Clinic, there are a couple more things that I would consider. And that is, of course, the sleep apnea, because um, and I'm talking about obstructive sleep apnea with patients who are big. I don't see that as often uh, in in Singapore. See a lot of and, that in the United States where people are <laughs> really overweight. Yes. Yeah. And the other thing is the African-Americans in whom I would consider hydralazine and nitrates. So, you know, those, those are the sort of things that you tuck behind. And now also vaccination. Oh, absolutely. So I've got this little checklist of the other things, right? You start with the four and then just a little checklist in my mind of those other things that I've got covered or not. Yeah. I like that because that gives, I think, our audience the sense of the very, very important things that you've got to do regardless. And then all the other things that could modify, especially this iron business, how often have I seen with anemia or without anemia and the residents say to me, oh, that's chronic. Well, there is no such thing as chronic anemia of heart, of heart failure that I know of. Um, you got to work it up. And, and I've been starting to use the IV iron uh, you know, uh, preparations. And you're right. I mean, th the way that the patients feel is amazing. Yeah. We, d we yeah. don't do that with any of our drugs. Um, yeah. Yeah. Ileana, you know, it's personal to me because I got iron deficient during my pregnancy. Me too. <laughs> and you remember how it felt? Terrible. I mean, you're but exhausted. imagine you got heart failure on top of it. <laughs> yeah, so, you're you're you exhausted. Know. 
and you're yeah. not eating enough to to compensate exactly uh and the iron sulfate tablets do not get absorbed yes it's not work they so, actually make you feel sick <laughs> exactly exactly so i i think that we have so many tools now um but i like your your initial posture which is let's look at the basic things that we've got to get done and that's a good it's like a road map yeah. to give to the patients i'm always thinking of easy ways to tell the patients what I want to do. Um, yeah. And I always do say to them, you're not going to be on the same dose tomorrow as you are today. I'm going to keep changing these, but we'll give you updated lists, you know, which is now how important is it to have it in the electronic health record be accurate with what the patient is on. And it often is not. Yeah, so, Eliana, you bring up such a good yeah. point about the communication yeah. to moderate their expectations so that they're not feeling when we up titrate that, oh, no, what are you doing? Yeah, Why exactly. so many? They, well? They'll know it right up front. Exactly. And secondly, so that they know, for example, we're not putting them on an ACE inhibitor for their hypertension. So right. I cannot tell you how many times that has happened where they then go to the GP who or takes the it off. The pharmacist they is you're not them. hypertensive. And I'm like, it's not for hypertension. Yeah, it's the for pharmacist your- is telling them this is a blood pressure drug. Exactly. Yeah, so we need yeah. to explain it. And you're right. So maybe as uh, all our society should come up with Um, a roadmap, literally, or a strategy that everybody could agree upon and and put it out there so that patients get the right care. And especially for our advanced practice nurses and pharmacists who do just a great, great job with up titration of drugs. Uh, I think we'll leave it at that. Carol and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the ESC. I hope you enjoy the rest of your summer. A big hug to that baby. Uh, And thanks again for spending time with me today. Huge hugs. Thank you, Ileana. This is Ileana Pina. I'm signing off. I hope this is helpful to you in your practice. Have a great day.